And we are recording and we're live on Facebook. All right, I'm John Mercer, president of Las Vegas Triathlon Club. And I've got Ted Gerard, ambassador of the Las Vegas Triathlon Club. And I'm so glad to uh, kick off our Las Vegas Triathlon Club Pro Talk uh, with Laura Sadal. This is, uh, this is great. And uh, Laura, we met only because of Instagram. I followed you already on Instagram because I've always liked listening to you on podcasts. You're always uh, very honest, you're, you're insightful. And I really have a neat perspective on triathlon and other things related to triathlon. So I've always uh, liked listening on podcasts. And then one time I, this last year, I saw a post and I'm like, hey, I know where she is right now. And that looks like <laughs> Las Vegas. And so I just quickly reached out to you in Las Vegas. And, uh, and sure enough, you were here in town doing a uh, training camp. And uh, you were you know, generous enough to uh, visit with our group. This is all pre-COVID-19, obviously. Uh, and it was uh, it was great to meet you in person and talk with you and uh, really you know it was neat to uh, just hear you talk and uh, and some of the things and, and perspectives you have of, of triathlon and uh, so now that we've been doing Ted and I've been doing these uh, video calls I thought I'd reach out to you for uh, some more insight uh, electronically and you're again generous enough to do this so welcome. No, thank you. It's uh, it's good to be here. It was good to hear when you reached out. We had a, yeah, it was funny back in February, sort of having that connection and then caught up with you guys and you took me to a good coffee place in, in Vegas and then caught up with the rest of the team over dinner. So uh, yeah, it's really good to be back in touch with everyone, albeit now on other sides of the world and with everything that's gone on over the last few months yeah little little did we know sitting sitting all together back in february that and we were talking about races and we we're talking about who was doing what race for the season ahead and everyone was getting excited because it was at you know starting to get the races coming into race season and yeah here we are in different places a few months on <laughs> nobody uh, thought we'd ever be sitting sitting here doing, no, it, it, that's yeah. right. it was really only whatever six months ago and uh and everything has changed. But I have to say, you know, it was great that you visited because I posted that question on the Tribe Club page, uh, page about, you know, where to go for coffee. And I actually couldn't believe all the different coffee spots we have here in town. And so now uh, what my wife and I do each Monday is we go to a different coffee place. So ah. it, it was actually a neat, uh, neat thing I love to cover. Yeah, so. yeah, I was, um, I was super impressed because to be fair, living in, so I, I you know, I live in, normally at uh, New Zealand and Spain and they're very big coffee coffee cultures and I've always to be fair given the American or the US a bit of a hard time with coffee yeah. but so when I was there and we found all these amazing like roaster you know independent roasters and these cool cafes and and the one we went to so yeah oh, that, that's really cool I'm glad that you're now exploring the different the different cafes as well yeah no that's great well and okay, so let's let's jump into you do travel a lot, but you're obviously you're not traveling uh, right now, and you had a lot of races on your schedule. Uh, but you also were recovering from an injury, and how's that going? Are you? Um, well, yeah, I'm still I'm still recovering. Um, huh. It's been it's taken so I. Yeah, gosh, well, it was February, saw you and I was recovering. Well, I then after Vegas, I went up to Boulder and spent a few more weeks up there with my coach, Julie Dibbons. And when we were up there, we just got the shoulder checked out by some specialists there just to see how it was recovering and to see if I could get back to doing more activity. And um, it turned out it was it was meant to be healing naturally at that point. And it turned out it wasn't healing very well naturally. And um, it was still quite misaligned. It wasn't really joining up. There's a bit of a gap. So at that point, we decided that I would have it plated again. Um, so I had it plated when I was in Boulder. And again, that was literally sort of the week before everything started started shutting down. Um, I think I got into surgery pretty much on the last day that they were doing uh, before they shut down to non non emergency uh, procedures. Um, so yeah, had it had it plated. So then sort of went back to going through all the rehab. Um, a week later, I actually flew back to the UK. So I'm now, and that's where I am at the moment. That's where I've been for the last however long six months I've lost track of time um lit very kindly my sister allowed me to stay at her house I think she probably thought it was only for about three weeks to start with <laughs> like we all did and however many months later um and then yeah so sort of started rehabbing again really to with the shoulder having had the surgery um 
and we've just been taking it really steady. So I, I did start swimming again. I was lucky I had access to a, uh, an endless pool uh, when everything was obviously shut down, but I did have access to an endless pool through, through a contact. Um, and I started swimming and it was all good, but we had some x-rays and it was just showing that the bone was taking, taking a long time to heal. So we took the swimming out. We went back to just sort of mainly focusing on um, the swimming and the running, uh, sorry, biking and the running and rehab and strength and, um, and just not rushing things. Cause then as the months went on and the weeks went on and the races were disappearing, it was kind of like, well, there's, there's no rush to, uh, there's the opportunity to do this properly. And if we think about longer term health um, after triathlon, this is probably the better path to do. Um, it's been incredibly frustrating. I will say that now I'm still not able to swim. I have another x-ray at the end of August. Um, and then hopefully I'll get the all clear then to start doing something of this, of the swimming nature. Uh, um, you know, I haven't properly swum since February and the injury feels like it's been dragging. Well, it's been dragging on since March, 2019. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is what it is. We've been able to do lots of other good stuff working on my running and on the bike and that's all been fine and lots of work in the gym. So yeah, the injury is still, still there, unfortunately. And I'm, I'm trying to be patient. And I guess, you know, lots of people say, well, you know, if, if this is going to happen at any time, it's kind of a good time to happen with not the races. And yeah, for sure, there's, you know, there's not that pressure with, although, yeah, depending what happens at the end of the year going into next year, I will say there's never a good time to be injured as an athlete. Like you don't, you don't want to be injured. You want to be able to do things to your full ability, regardless of the environment, you know, regardless of the global, global world. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is what it is. And as an opportunity, you know, we just have to do it take the time, be patient, make sure I get the bone healed properly before jumping back into anything. Yeah, well, that, that's, um, that, that's a great message for people to hear. And, you know, you're still defending champion of Ironman Australia, right? So <laughs> yeah. you, you won that three times, right? Yeah, that's right. I did. I, I won it three times and the plan had been obviously when it was on in may was to get back to to race be able to race in in may and then it was pushed back to september and i was mm -hmm. when i had to have the surgery i was like okay well maybe it's still i could maybe still get there for september and obviously then and then it was one of the casualties like many other races so yes i am currently still <laughs> defending champion and can hold that title for another year before the race happens again <laughs> well so, i, I I just have a quick follow-up, if, if it's okay. I don't want to get obviously too deep into your to, into your medical world, but I think it's really interesting that you know you you're having this this happen. And what have some of the experts told you as far as you know maybe physiologic reasons why you're having a non-union fracture? This is a non-union and not healing. Is there something underlying? I mean, I just because it's it's it is kind of unusual, and, and and I know that I know other athletes have struggled with this. Yeah, um, I think, and and that's I guess that that side of it's been the casualty of covid so it's been really hard to get answers and to find people to talk to and there's several reasons for that and one i'm so because like we said i travel so much so i'm now in the fourth healthcare system right dealing with the same injury so they pick up and they're only picking up with what they see at that you're presenting at that time and they don't really they're not it's hard to get someone who's then interested in the past history they're right. just dealing with what you're presenting and getting that better also with it being current times and covid it's really not a priority in the world of you know everyone's dealing with yeah. the coronavirus so trying to get anyone to give me any attention to take the time because they just don't have it because obviously they're bigger things to deal with it's been really hard to get answers and that's what that's what the frustration's been um i feel it's kind of along the the path I've been given misinformation, but then trying to get anyone to help me piece it together or anyone to be a continuity through that has been quite difficult. So, but we, we're kind of getting somewhere. I've, I've had quite a lot of blood tests. I had another set of blood tests uh, last week. So we're waiting for the results back from them. Um, I've had a DEXA scan. I've had a few other tests done that we can try and get done during, you know, during the time. Um, it's just been really slow and that's kind of where the, 
the patience and the frustration has been. I think if um, in a normal world or maybe in the US or different healthcare systems, um, you progress things quite quickly. Um, the NHS is brilliant in certain aspects and it's really slow and old getting things done in other aspects. Um, so that's just been the frustration, but hopefully, yes, that was kind of the questions we were asking. Why is it taking so long? Um, one of the answers we've had is, or one of the, the reasons is that um, it actually would have been better for me to have a complete break again. So a stress fracture takes a lot longer. And, and this is the misinformation I was given when I did the stress fracture in February. I was told it was a four week, four week natural heal, I'd be back. Well, then the people I've spoken to since are saying actually a stress fracture takes a lot longer than a normal break because of the way the stress fracture forms and it's all the different fibers and bones and stuff that 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 weaken around it it's not just a a straight fracture which then they can heal and the bone grows um, and i'm absolutely butchering the medical terms here so i'm sure someone but yeah so a stress fracture just takes a lot longer and I think as a consequence of doing, having the, the break in May last year, the surgery again in December, there's obviously just been a lot of stresses and strains there. Um, I, and when, so we're just trying to find out, yeah, and dig a little bit more to see. I mean, hopefully the x-ray in the next couple of weeks comes back and shows that it is, it is finally sort of knitted together and looking strong. Um, I'm certainly sort of starting to ask a few more questions now that, things are opening up a little bit and although now everyone's obviously got a backlog of of surgeries and stuff but um yeah hopefully the blood test might show if there is anything that's that i that is affecting struggling for the bone to heal and anything else yeah when it's hard honestly it's really hard to find good people i mean i'm in the sports medicine world um it's hard to find people that understand the the, you know, the physiology of stress fracture and you're right it does take long because it's a metabolic issue Right, yeah. stress fracture happens because of a, of a metabolic issue, and so you have to turn that metabolic issue around. Whereas, if you fracture yourself and your bone is healthy to begin with, it's not a metabolic issue. It's like this is just going to heal, yeah. And there's nothing to turn around. It's just it's just going to automatically stimulate uh, stimulate new healing. So good. Well, anyways, thank you. I just want to uh, to to follow up with that, and, and you know, obviously we don't have to go too deep into that because I know it's, that's uh, all right. I will follow up after this call, and we'll have a further chat. <laughs> I would, I would love to have a, a chat with you about it and some ideas yeah. that I have around that. And Definitely. Well, yeah. well, you know, what I'm hearing, and, and, and this is good for, for people to know, is that when you have an injury, you can't leave any stone unturned. You've got to, yeah, and you really need to be your own advocate. And you, know, you end up being, becoming a, a little bit of an expert in your, you know, on your injury. And, you know, that's, you know, it's good. To, it's a good message for people to hear that you, are, are doing that and and this is the way that people should approach it yeah yeah uh, and i i think a lot of it's about it's it's really hard for us as athletes or for me as a professional as well is that you you want to get better now because you want to be able to train and race where um my coach julie dibbins has been very you know when as things sort of started developing and we were finding out more and having to pull back a bit more she was and, and she's had a whole host of injuries through her career. So she's very experienced in this mm -hmm. area, but she was, she's been really good at saying, no, this isn't just about the here and now this is like, uh, which is really hard. Cause that's, we want to just get out and race and train. She's like, this is about the future health of you, your body, family, you know, further down the line, you've got to think about what the, the, the longer term implications are if you don't get this right this time now. So just, you know, take going back to when you started triathlons, obviously you're not thinking that way at all. You know, you're just, you know, go, go, go and, you know, volume and, and intensity. I mean, you, you started back in the, uh, about 2011? Um, complete beginner started 2009, but yeah. Oh, okay. And then, yeah, and was an age grouper for a few years and then um, took my pro license and went full time at the, End of, two, end, end of 2013, beginning of 2014. So what, if you, if you can think back to 2009, how, how did you get into your first race and, and what, was, what was going on and what, do you remember the first race? Oh, oh yes. Um, I've got plenty of pictures. Yeah, I'd, um, I'd just moved to Australia 
uh, with my current job at the time. I was working for Shell as, a, as an engineer and I guess I'd always done sport growing up. I'd been a, a track runner, so 400s, 800s. Um, I'd played some team, team sports as well. And I arrived in Australia and I guess I was looking to carry on the running and get, in, get into the track again. Um, but just didn't really find a group that I connected with or just something was missing. And anyway, colleagues from work were doing a charity bike ride, which was a, a 56 mile bike ride down the coast from Sydney to a town called Wollongong through the national park, absolutely stunning. And then you, you cycle one way and get the train back. And they just said, oh, you know, we're doing this in a couple of weeks, you should come along. So I was like, well, I don't have a bike and haven't ridden since a kid sort of thing or university days, um, but bought a bike literally maybe a couple of weeks before the race. It was a, a hybrid mountain bike, road bike, you know, a flat bar across the top, just flat pedals, nothing extravagant. It was probably far too, if I look at the pictures now, it looks far too small for me as well. I look like this giant on a kid's bike. Um, Anyway, I did the I did this cycle ride with them. I really enjoyed it. It was just a great fun. I, I definitely, I don't think it, you know, it wasn't anything amazing of going, you can be a, a cyclist or triathlete, but it was just great fun. And um, it was really off the back of that, that the same friends from work said, oh, you should, you should try triathlon. Um, you know, it's in Australia, it's kind of what everyone does at the weekend. It's, you go down to the beaches, you go to the parks and everyone's swim ride running it's kind of what they they do as a nation um so yeah kind of went online and looked for a beginner's course and found a group that were running running a course in i think it was january and a six-week course so knew i'd be with a, a group of other complete newbies um did the course and the course then finished in time with a local race a local sprint race so you kind of did you signed up for the course and then had the opportunity to do this race at the end and um I remember doing that race again. It was sort of all the beginners that had gone through the course. I was still on my hybrid hybrid mountain road bike. Um, I can't remember much apart from I remember um, everyone just flying past me on these like TT bikes or proper road bikes and going, I'm getting a road bike. I'm getting a proper bike. I'm not doing it on this on this mountain bike again. And I remember my transition from bike to run was very quick because I was already in my trainers from being on the bike. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just remember I really, I enjoyed it. I loved it. I, the beginners group that we had um, was also integrated into a more experienced training group, I guess. And so even though we were doing the sessions as complete newbies into the sport, I could see the other athletes training and there were athletes training for this longer distance, this thing called Ironman or Iron Distance and being a sport, someone who's always done sport and kind of addicted in that and seeing this challenge of going, well, how, how can we're doing, we're beginners and we're doing this, but I want to do what they're doing. That looks, you know, that looks, it looks more, it's more challenging. I want to do that sort of stuff. So yeah, kind of got, got sucked in then, then that way, but it took me a, it took me a few years to, well, no, I did, in my very first year as a as a beginner, I signed up for an Ironman, as we all do, stupidly, um, because I also thought I was only going to be in Australia for a couple of years. So I thought, well, if I'm going to do this Ironman or this Iron Distance, I might as well do it while I'm in Australia because the weather's nice. It's going to be nice for training. Whereas if I go back to the UK, it's not going to be much fun. And I don't know anything about triathlon back in the UK. Um, so I did a full distance at the end of 2009 when I'd started at the beginning. Again, it was purely a tick the box exercise. It was nothing special. I wouldn't. And after that race, I remember crossing the line and saying, I am doing sprints and Olympics from now on. <laughs> I'm not doing any of this long course again. Um, and so the next few years went back to doing, yeah, sprint distance and Olympic distance as an age grouper and absolute, yeah, absolutely loved it. Oh, that's great. Wow, that's amazing. That I didn't know that you did an Ironman your first year. <laughs> so it was just a challenge uh, of the distance that attracted you to it? Yeah, it was, I think, the fact, sort of ha having done sport growing up um, and that athletics or that track background and, you know, I was doing this beginner's course, but I could see these other athletes that were training for this Ironman and they seemed to be doing more reps or more distance and that just there was obviously something about that that appealed to my personality as an athlete and I was kind of like well I, I want to do what they're doing and they seemed to have there was this big 
energy and hype around them. And when it came up to the races that they were doing, it was like, wow, this is amazing. And they were just sort of these athletes put on this pedestal. Um, and yeah, it just drew me in. And I think there were a few of us from the beginners course that actually stupidly or however you want to say it, gullibly signed up for that Ironman at the end of the year. And there was a group, of, I think there was about six of us and it was all our first time oh. doing the, the Ironman. We did um, Ironman WA Western Australia in Bustleton. Oh. Um, and I still keep in contact with those, those guys. Um, and we still sort of catch up and send messages every now and again. I'm happy to say I beat all the boys, which was obviously the, the bragging rights of the race. Um, but yeah, then, and, but I, it's hard. I don't really, I, I kind of, it's not that I forget it or don't count it. It was very much just as a beginner in the sport doing that tick the box of, I want to complete an Ironman. There was no aspir. The only aspirations was to beat the boys. There was nothing about, I had no idea about age group winning or which I didn't, I don't even, I couldn't even tell you where I came. I wouldn't even be in top 10 sort of thing in my age group. Um, but it was, it was more about being with the group and training through and all going through this together from being sort of very beginner to then literally just to get to the start line and then to get to the finish line and have, have, yeah, had that sense of accomplishment. Um, yeah, and that was kind of the pure, the pure reason for doing it. That's, that's great. And, and what I love about it is you just started with whatever equipment you had. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, it's, it's so often, you know, there's a perceived roadblock to getting involved with triathlon, you know, that, you know, people may think they need a special bike or, you know, shoes or wetsuit or what have you, but sometimes yeah. you just got to start and just try it. Totally, totally. I think there's, there is this real perception or a barrier that you need you need the top of the the top range of the gear or you need this fancy equipment and you that really shouldn't be a blocker to starting especially if you're doing if you're doing the short super sprints or the sprint distance which is the best option for somebody as a beginner entering the sport like yeah i did it i did it on this sort of mountain bike hybrid with my trainers I, I'm trying to think, I, I'm not even sure if I had a wetsuit. I think I might have swum and we were lucky that maybe it was warm water in, in Australia, but I think I probably just swum in like tri-suit, which would have been shorts and a, shorts and a t, not a t-shirt, but a, a, ve a yeah, tri-vest. Right. It definitely wouldn't have been any fl anything flash. No. Um, it would have been very much a normal helmet and, no. and I probably wouldn't have had a clue about, I mean, it's a sprint distance, but I'm not even sure whether I had any nutrition with me at all. Yeah. Oh, that's great. All right, yeah. but now um, sprint versus iron distance. I mean, that's like two ends of the spectrum. But yet, you know, you can make a sprint as hard as as you, you want. I mean, but I, it's a different kind of hard. I mean, how do you how do you explain the the enjoyment of doing sprint and the enjoyment of doing iron distance? And how do you how do you contrast those? Um. Oh, great. Sprint's great because it's over by breakfast <laughs> and you can, you can then go for coffee and breakfast with all your mates having di and dissect the race and, and it's all good fun. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy them both it, at all distance for different reasons. Like the sprint is just, it's short, it's sharp. It does use another kind of system. So it does still hurt. It is still, you know, cause you are full, full gas. There's no, there's no let off. There's nothing about pacing. It's just pretty much from the gun you go now. Um, I, I will say on the non-drafting side of it, I would be hopeless in a draft legal race because I just haven't got a swim to go to go with it. Um, but then I don't know. There's for me with my type of physiology, I'm um, I am more of that slow burning diesel engine. Um, the iron distance, I just. I enjoy it from that challenge. It's, it's so difficult to get, to, to work it out, to get it right. You've got to balance so many things on the day. Um, it's not just, it's not about going, well, it, it's getting nearer to going flat out from the gun, but it's not quite there yet as, as the pace and all these athletes move up the distances, but there's a lot more in it. Um, you know, you know, you're going to hit highs and lows throughout the day. And how do you manage that? You've got to consider nutrition and, you get to, I guess what I love about it actually is um, the time you are on course with the other athletes is longer. 
so the time you are on course with age groupers racing you know when you're on that marathon or even on the bike you just see each other a little bit more I think in that that sprint sort of so fast and furious but you catch up at the end kind of thing so um yeah they're both I think if I had the if I had the speed I'd probably stick to sprint distances because you can get it done and then go and have coffee and, and breakfast with your mates but I don't quite have that speed so um I kind of get stuck into being out there all day with everybody but that's you know and the thing I love about the iron distance as well is that there is you know you in a sprint distance you're not going back at midnight to welcome home everyone else you probably don't even go back at the end of a sprint distance to welcome home the last finishers of that sprinter olympic but at an iron distance event i the best thing about that day regardless of how your own personal race went is to go back for the you know 10 11 midnight hours and see the people coming home then and that's i think what makes that distance special yeah it, it certainly is uh that is a special time and and i agree with you on the sprint i think ted and i both do that i think we we don't really take any nutrition along. Uh, I, you know, if I take hydration, it's here in the summer, and it's usually because I'm just spitting water all over myself to stay cool, and not trying to drink it. Uh, I think it's interesting too, though, when you look at the physiology, right, of a sprint race, um, and you look at the time. So let's say a fast person in a sprint race, like a fast age group, or like an, an hour ten. That's like running uh, a ten mile race all out. Right. Yeah. And, and if you're a runner and you say, Hey, we're going to do a 10 mile race. You'd say, that's a long, <laughs> yeah. that's a long race. So you're getting close to half marathon almost. Right. For, and that's a sprint triathlon. Yeah. And I think sometimes there's a misnomer there with, especially like beginners and age groupers and um, the, Oh, well sprint. It's, it's just a sprint. It's just short. You're going an hour and 10 to an hour and a half all out. It's, it's no joke. And, and it's funny when you put it like that, because we all have our relative perception, don't we? And because we live in such a skewed world of triathlon, as much as we love it, those, you know, saying to anyone else that doing a sprint from outside the sport, like you said, they'd be like, heck, that's that's an hour. That's a decent, decent rank. And yet our perceptions are so skewed and warped. Yeah. And it's the same. I I always correct people like you will we'll go to a race. And it's when there's a 70.3 and a, a full distance on the same day. And I'll be talking to someone I'll say, oh, you know, what race are you doing in there? Oh, I'm just doing the 70.3. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, stop. There is no just doing the 70.3 about this. I was like, you are doing the 70.3. That's amazing. That's incredible. There's no like diminishing a half distance because there's then a full to go to. I think we, we very much get caught up in that. Yeah. And I think John made mention of it. Like any distance in triathlon yeah. could be, the hardest distance you know I have, a, yeah. I have a friend that doesn't like racing sprints because it's too hard yeah right? it's like because that red line feeling for like an hour and 10 minutes is not very comfortable whereas a half like you're not on that maybe on, quite on that red line instead of at 100 yeah. percent, you're at 95 percent. and there's a lot of people that are like you said the diesel engine kind of person they can go at 95 percent for four and a half five hours yeah. and it doesn't hurt as much as going 100 or 105 percent for an hour yeah. that's it i mean you only need to look at if you, if you take it on a professional side you watch an itu race be it sprint or olympic and you watch how many of them cross the line and collapse yeah. onto the floor because they have emptied themselves yeah i i like, think it's amazing to see right like the best some of the best athletes in the world literally collapsing after an hour and 10 minutes yes I mean, yeah or like sorry those guys maybe an hour but still, it's like they gave literally everything they had. It's, it's kind of like, you know, even if you watch like a, uh, the 3000 in the Olympics or yeah. in, 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 in athletics, after a 3000, these people are collapsing yeah. because they gave it everything they possibly had. And I, and I think that there's a misnomer in triathlon that sprint and Olympic in even half is not the real thing. Yeah, totally. Like, but like yeah. we look at the ITU and we look at like the Olympics, well, they take what distance <laughs> they take, right? The, the, exactly they're the ones that are at the olympic games they have you know if you you said if you said to me um would you prefer to win kona or to get an olympic gold medal i would pick the olympic gold medal like that to me is the that's the pinnacle of sport of any sport and so yeah we we do have this warp thing of going why aren't we saying that that is 
good enough to do sprint and Olympics. And even now it's super sprints kind of thing. And at super league level, and that's, you know, and sprint relays and stuff. And yet we still think it's that more is better. And maybe it's just me. I have to justify because I don't like doing full distance. I like doing 70.3s. Yeah. And it's like, I always feel like I'm, I'm less than. No, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm only out there for four and a half hours instead of, I'd say that I'd say that was smarter. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say you're the smart one out of all. Yeah, of see, I like to be done by I like to be done by lunch. Exactly, you're still done by lunch. That's right. <laughs> oh, perfect. And going going with seventy point three. I mean, that's that's where you actually came to Las Vegas years ago and had some initial success with the world when the world championships were here. That's right. Yeah, my. Uh, first trip to Vegas was, um, so that was at a stage where I, I was still racing as an age grouper. Um, but I, friends were starting to talk about, I was about four years into doing triathlon and I guess friends were starting to say, Oh, you, have you thought about turning professional and should you, you should be a, a pro and you should get your pro card. And for me, I was at this stage, I was still doing sprints and Olympics. So it's kind of like, well, there's no way I can get my pro card because that's racing ITU and I'm, I don't have the swim and I, you know, I'm winning age group. Yes, but it's non-drafting and it's very different. And the only way, and also growing up sport was very much seen as the hobby, you know, growing up in the UK, you went to school, you went to university, you got the job and yes, yeah, sport was great. Um, and it looked good on your CV because it made you look like you had other interests outside of academics and stuff like that. And not just that corporate career, but it was always the hobby. So suddenly sort of people saying you should turn professional and you can do sport as a profession. It was quite new to me. Um, but the only reason I, the only way I was going to do that was by moving up the distances. And I was a lot older. I, I got into the sport quite late on compared to most people. So it was inevitable that I was, ha and again, like we said, with physiology, it was inevitable that I was going to have to move up to the half and the full. So I, so 2013, we um, picked to do a 70.3. We did Honu uh, 70.3 again with a group of friends from the training group. You see, this is what's good about, you know, you pick these nice, nice races to go and do. And um, I was fortunate enough to win my age group in Honu. And that actually, it actually qualified me for Kona and the 70.3 world champs that year. But I, Kona was still kind of this, I didn't really know much about it. And yes, I'd done that Ironman a long time ago, but I'd kind of pushed that behind. And so I actually turned down my Kona slot mm. that year, which the girl that was in second place just absolutely started. <laughs> you know, she couldn't believe her luck because she just assumed I would be taking it. Um, and I took the spot to the 70.3 world champs. And so, yeah, and that was the 2013 in Las Vegas. So yeah, came over to Vegas. Um, and we were out at Lake, Lake Mead and it was a, a lovely rainy day to start with. And then a very steamy day on the run after the yeah. end. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and was lucky again, got a, got the age group win and the, um, overall female amateur win. And I think it was at that point. I kind of started saying, okay, maybe there is something, maybe I should consider this a little bit more now. I've, I've done a couple of races at that half distance and I can show that as an age grouper, I'm competitive within the amateur ranks. Um, so yeah, kind of. I mean, that, that, from that, there. That's amazing to win that race. So, uh, you know, when you, when you crossed that finish line, did you know that you had already won at that point or did you know where you were or? No, um, I had a feeling. So I, no, I didn't. So there was kind of, there was me and there was a few other uh, friends that were racing, but we were all different age groups. And, but I, and then other than that, I, I had no idea about the triathlon world. I had no, you know, it was, it was only my second 70 or third 70.3, but second of recent time. Um, I, if you'd have shown me the start list of the other women in my age group, I wouldn't have had a clue who any of them were, if they were any good, anything like this. But I remember being on the run and I saw a friend watching and I was just trying, I was yelling. So I was like, where am I? Can you get me a split? Am I, you know, am I in the lead? Am I not in the lead? Where, you know, where is anyone else in the race? And I think, I can't remember whether he just couldn't get any information, like the tracker wasn't working or whatever it was, but yeah. I think I got something to say that I had a 10 minute lead at that point or, or, or it was something, but it, but you can't trust it. Like, I still was like, I don't believe that, you know, I, 
you're, you're doing that that horrible run up and down the road on the L shape right. and it all feels That's like right. it's uphill and the sun's out by that time and, and the heat's up and I just I, 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 and I couldn't see any other I didn't know who other females were in my age group I couldn't for whatever reason couldn't tell for calves or, or whatever so I I kind of knew but then I you just didn't believe it and you never trust it because I you know you until you step over that finish line anything can happen like you've seen we've seen people collapsing minutes from the finish line and, mm -hmm. and not making it so um it was kind of like when I crossed that finish line I hoped Mm -hmm. I had and I hoped that had all been correct and I I knew I'd had a good day and a good performance so that's what I was happy with I was like I've done the best I could on the day I felt I really um I had to put it down there on the bike and then I you know I held it together as much as I could on the run um but yeah and then you and then you go through the recovery area and you I think we walked around and there was someone printing out printing out the results sort of there and then so you're quickly like going are the results and are the results in but I think with the at that point, like with the waves, yeah, it was wave start. So it should have been, if I was the first result in, then I think I knew at that point. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So when you did realize that you won, what, what was that? What was that like? Is it just like a euphoric it's, feeling or it just, yeah, it's kind of, I, 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 I'd been, I guess I'd been working towards that. So there's kind of that huge satisfaction and, I don't think that race was a relief. I think it was more just, yeah, that's what, that's what I've done it. And that's what I've worked to do. And we managed to get that, get that result. And then, you know, you're trying to find your friends cause you're in a different, you know, I didn't have family with me at that time, but had obviously other friends from Australia or who were racing. And so, but you're trying to find them in the recovery area. And then I think I got overexcited because I suddenly saw all the pro women who had finished and they were all like chatting together. I'm like, and then I, and then you start recognizing a few people. You're like, oh my God, that's so-and-so and that's so-and-so. And you're seeing some coaches that you know of, of being in the sport. And um, so I think you, you're just on, it was just such a high. Um, and then I also knew that I had to kind of be pretty after that race, I was actually then flying kind of two days later to, to London for the ITU World Championships and and the Olympic distance and so I was kind of like this was amazing and we can celebrate and then and my friends that I was with Kim she won her age group which was great and we had the awards and it was all amazing and it was um Sebastian Kinley won the men's that year and I am trying to think who won the women's and that's awful because that's the one I should know but I just remember Sebastian was an incredibly funny speech that he gave at the awards um and then yeah got on a plane and went to london and sort of kind of went through it all again <laughs> so mm. but yeah it was just um it, it's an amazing feeling like you just that there there's so much that goes into the races and it is all about just putting your best performance out and regardless of the result if you know you've given it all that's all you can ask for but there is something special when you find out that that, that you won and that's what you've worked towards and, and that's been that goal. Yeah. Oh, that, that's so neat. And yeah, I think that's a great message for people to hear is you just got to race your race. And, and that, and then, you know, when you cross that line, that's what I'm hearing is that that was your satisfaction was that, you know, you did the best you could do and it turned out to be a world championship. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. really neat. So along the way, you know, Ted and I talk about, you know, triathlon science, and before this call, we were talking about art and science of uh, about triathlon. When when did you start to realize that there was a science behind training? And when did you realize that, well, there's still quite a bit of art with training? And then I want to add one little caveat to this. Coming from you being, you know, an engineer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so obviously I have a, have a, have a, like a math and science background. Yeah. Um, I think you, I think you realize pretty early on I think from my I've always I guess growing up through sport I've always had a coach so I've always been lucky that I've had a coach whether that's been team sports or whether that's been my athletics so I guess I've always been reliant on a coach to to some extent dictate that science I guess and and, and to give the sessions and to I'm I then just execute the sessions again I've kind of also um 
yeah i i have obviously have an interest but i've also grown up you know i, was, I spent a year in the military as well and so i'm almost i'm almost kind of want to if you tell me what to do i'll do it <laughs> like that's that hierarchy like if that's the session i'm gonna do it um but i think it's been more as i've grown and developed as an athlete that you start to learn with having those goat coaches and the good coaches that communicate with you but help you learn along the way of going there is an element where we use numbers and numbers are great and there is an element where the numbers are a hindrance and that's the arts kind of it and you know there's no numbers out there that are going to make you feel at one with the bike yep. and how you ride your bike as one in that sort of a fully embodied thing on its own if you know you can you can have the numbers there and this is actually a discussion i'm having with my coach at the moment like you can have the numbers there and you've been looking at your power and you can be looking at your heart rate but you're still wrestling a bike you're not riding your bike and because it's more about the speed and it's almost like getting as much speed out the bike as you can for the least amount of power and effort and that's when you start talking about there's that art of the art of how you ride the bike, the art of how you um, ride a course, ride the terrain, the different road surfaces, a corner, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I, my view is they very much go hand in hand. So from the engine, if I go back to then the engineering side of things, um, the engineering side of me is the over analytical, the over after us. It's not so much wanting to know the science of the session that I've been set or questioning that I trust my coach. I trust the process and that's what I need to do, but I get over analytical after the session. So I just can't do a session and then go, yep, yeah, tick, great, done, feel good or felt rubbish and leave it. I, I overthink it, drag it out for a lot longer. And, and that's my engineering brain that does that. I think. Um, so yeah, it's, and that I think is what I love about the sport as well is it's fascinating and you can have people who are very scientific in their approach and measure everything. You know, if we look at the Norwegians as an Olympic squad are doing testing all the time and they want to know all that and that's how they manage their program. And that's great. And it obviously works for, for some athletes and it works for their setup. And then I love also kind of the other theory of people who don't use anything and it is just on feel and rate of effort and there's a little bit more give or take of how their body they're, they're maybe a bit more in tune with their body um i try and feel there's got to be a balance of the two and at certain times one will be a higher preference and at certain times the other one will hmm. yeah oh that's great now you know the, the the art and science of training we think of swim by run but then there's the whole nutrition part as well. Yeah. And, and I did read on your, on your uh, webpage, your nutrition approach is if you see it, you eat it type of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like when, maybe, maybe even talk about that. Like where, where did you realize that one, you needed to do the art and science of swim, bike, run, but then there's this whole other element of, uh, of nutrition. Yeah, I, because I have no willpower with nutrition <laughs> is basically where we're at um and so give me calories like and i just i i am very much kind of like everything in moderation just healthy balanced diet lots of fruit lots of veg lots of salads and stuff your proteins and, and your meats and that sort of thing um but don't restrict yourself of anything either so don't um, and again, this doesn't, this is just me. It's, it's my own, my own feelings and thoughts. Um, I, I tend to find if I restrict myself, I'll then absolutely go and have a binge blowout. And then because I'm not kind of monitoring it over time or having it in moderation over time. Um, I'm also, I just have, I don't have willpower to restrict. Like if I, it's like you, 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 you open a bar of chocolate. There's no way I can have one piece and put it back in the fridge. If I've opened a bar of chocolate, the whole chocolate's going to go in like one sitting kind of thing. Cause then I'll only feel guilty once as well, but that doesn't stop me then buying another one the next day, which is perhaps where you kind of get that balance. Um, I mean, yeah, so I, and I've just not found, um, 
the right person that kind of I can connect with on a more nutritional science base or not science basis but structured basis um at the moment as well you know, like I'm a little bit more lax with it um mm -hmm. I'm having you know a glass of wine probably more than I would do if I was in a race season or in a more considered training mm -hmm. block I'm I am having that bit more chocolate being a chocoholic um I'm kind of not trying to restrict myself because I think in these times we need to kind of feed our soul as well and may do what's going to make us make us just get through things um but probably like sort of in a, a more regular training series or heading into races. Yeah, I do, whether it's called you restrict, I do monitor that and just make sure I am eating fairly clean, fairly healthy. Um, I think there's a big perception and I still struggle with it around. I feel I'm overeating all the time. Um, and so you try and maybe think, you try and monitor or again, sort of control what you're eating. And because I have a big appetite, I can eat as much as I, you know, I, I don't have that stop point. So I'm kind of conscious of that. And then perhaps you find that actually you've probably under eaten because we actually need a lot more calories than we think. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's such a hard, and, and that's where I've kind of like tried to get people to help just to say what I, but, but also I really struggle just to do the calorie counting of going, I don't have the time or the patience to measure everything out when I'm cooking it. Like I have so much else going in my head about thinking about training, thinking about everything else I'm doing that when I come to food, I just need to be able to make it really quickly and really easily. And it's got pretty much covers the food groups that I need to, to get my recovery in. Um, and if I have to think anything more about that, then I kind of struggle. <laughs> You know, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, though, with ultra distance or long distance training. Um, I think that's the biggest issue is not eating enough. Yeah. Right? So if you look at this, the science here, you know, depending on your body weight, you're looking at 600 to 800 calories per hour when you're training. Right. So if you do a four hour training session, which is not long. I mean, I, I, I know you do longer than that. But let's say you do four hours and let's say it's 700 you're looking at 2,800 calories on top of your basal metabolic rate, on top of everything else. If you go for groceries, you go walk here, you go do that. So it's not unreasonable to say, you know, you need to eat 4,500 calories a day. Yeah. And eating 4,500 calories a day clean is impossible. Yeah. Like you, I hate to say it, but like, and I know, because I've listened to some of your stuff and read some of your stuff, you don't really supplement but you are, you're supplementing with chocolate. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and honestly, like that bar of chocolate, that's five or 600 calories. Let's say like you have a big bar of chocolate, yeah. that's supplementing calories that you need. Like, I don't yeah. want to be, I'm not your nutritionist, but I think that other like long distance athletes need to see that and not feel guilty about that. Because if everything in your life is clean, like you're, you're eating lots of fruit and veg and you're eating your good protein sources and your good fat sources, good luck getting that amount of calories yeah and and the other interesting thing on this is going through an injury yeah so it's a real tough headspace to be in because when you're going through an injury you think i'm not training as much yeah. so i don't need to eat as much because i don't want to don't want to put on weight or whatever those reasons are you're like i'm not doing all those training hours i don't need as many calories but you're injured and you're trying to heal. So in yeah. fact, again, you should almost be eating more. You need to be anabolic. When you're training yeah. because you're you need injury. to give the bones, the muscles, everything that is to repair. But it's such a hard thing to get your head around because all your thing, because you kind of just typically think, I'm not training. I don't need as many calories because I don't want to put all that weight on or whatever it is. And yet, actually, you know, and the, one of the one of the specialists I said is like you should not be, and then bring into virtual bring in bring it in virtual racing world yeah. where it's all done on ed, an entered weight into the program and it's all watts per kilo and it's such a big thing now. Yeah, and then it's kind of like, heck, I shouldn't. We shouldn't be race weight at the moment. We shouldn't be race weight. We're not racing. We should have a few extra, but it's so hard when there's other things the virtual racing going on and it's so hard to go. But I'm. I'm not training, so I need to, but I need to be eating more because I'm injured, you know, I'm injured and I need to be healing a bone sort of thing. So there's, there's that as well. That's really. Yeah. I think that comes in also like, what is race weight? Like, race weight probably yeah. should be, what is your best Watts per kilogram? Yeah. 
right? Yeah. Because if I get too low, my watts per kilogram goes lower, right? Yes. And we often don't measure ourselves on that, right? Like that, that like most people are like, oh, my race weight, well, I raced once and I was, you know, 130 pounds or whatever. And I raced really good that day. Yeah. So that's my, that's my race weight. Well, maybe, maybe not. Cause you know, there's lots of other variables that can go into it, but we have this ability. If you have the technology to literally figure out what, at what weight do you have the most Watts per kilogram? Yeah. Right. And, and, and it's difficult to figure it out, but you can. Yeah. And the, and then, then, then that's the other thing about our sport and being triathlon is your best Watts, you know, if, and it's a, it's a touchy subject, but often less weight will make you run faster. Mm -hmm. I, I'm be really, I'm trying to be really careful mm -hmm. here because I don't want to go down the wrong alley, but that might then have that effect that you lose that power on the bike. And actually your gains are better to be a bit stronger on the bike and have that higher watts per kilogram, or you lose the effect in the swim of having that bit extra strength. So it's a really hard, like you said, what is our weight race weight that everyone talks about? And it, I often think it's actually as well got to come back. What do you feel most comfortable and happy at? And is that what and that's gets not even you the best? Into, like, doing, doing blood tests and looking at like your endocrine system and what, what is, what's your thyroid hormone at? What are your adrenal hormones at, at this, at this time? Because that yeah. truly tells the story, right? Yeah. Yeah. But most people don't go down that, don't, don't go down that road. But as a professional athlete, do you go down that road? Do you, do you do that kind of blood testing to see? Um, so I've started having a few more blood tests of later years. Um, but again, I kind of struggle a little bit with being so mobile that I don't necessarily have any one person to work with and help with that. And I don't know enough about it either. And to then have that, okay, this is saying this, what do we, what do we do around it? Um, I guess as well, and this is <laughs> not necessarily the right thing to do, but I, until this last couple of years, I've been really lucky with not being in my whole career and life. I've not really been sick. And I always touch wood this, doing this. I've not been sick. I've not been injured. Um, I've never really had any uh, issues or concerns in that area. So, and it's probably the wrong way to look at it, but I've never had a reason to start investigating that. Now that you could flip that around and go, well, you're a professional and to be the very best and to ease out and squeeze out those aspects of performance, that's what you should be doing on top just because you're trying to get out that best. And, and maybe it should, it's just not been something that's been readily open and available to me with, with how I've lived and traveled, I, th I guess. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Well, th th this is really neat. Now, what's also interesting is uh, not only are, are you knowledgeable in triathlon, but you, you give back to the sport in several different ways. And I know you're involved with lots of different initiatives. And I thought I'd uh, ask you to talk a little bit about the Challenge Athlete Foundation and, and the work that you're doing with them. Yeah, they're, um, so I started, I uh, learned about the Challenge Athletes Foundation when I moved to San Francisco and there was, there's quite a few CAF athletes in the Bay Area and there's a lot of people that do a lot of work with CAF in the Bay Area. So um, I kind of came exposed to the organization and just like, you know, sport, sport, I've been so lucky in my life and I've had so many amazing adventures and opportunities through sport and the power of sport is so strong regardless of, of where you come from. And I think we're seeing that now as well, like from a a mental and a physical well-being. I, I think we all knew that, but then we're sucked in and we love the sport. That's why we do it. But the benefits you get mentally and physically from sport and, and whatever reasons I, I think are so, are so good. Um, and yeah, I just, I just loved what the Challenged Athletes Foundation was doing. So using sport to give physically disabled um, athletes the chance to to be able to play sport and compete at sport. And, um, and then it really came home to me, um, or I really got involved. I was heading to Ironman Australia um, for, the, for the, first, the first time in, for, to race Ironman Australia. It was 2017. And about 10 days before the race, the news came round in the triathlon world of one of the other pros that was due to race. It was gonna be her first full distance pro race 
um, a girl called Lauren Parker had had a bike accident oh. and she'd ended up paralyzed from the waist down. Both her tires had burst, flooding into the guardrail. And I, I didn't know Lauren, I knew of her name, I knew we were gonna be racing together, but we'd never met before that. But I, it, just, it just struck me because we were meant to both be lining up at that race, like, you know, in 10 days time. And um, so I decided after the race, I was going to go and visit Lauren in hospital. And so um, I went down, I had no idea if it was the right thing to do, you know, I've, you know, never met her. She's obviously just going through this hugely traumatic time. Her life has just been changed forever. Would she want to meet me who's just come from on the race that she'd wanted, you know, that she was training for? Um, anyway, so I went and met her and just kind of, yeah spent some time with her we talked to her i after that visit i then got in touch with bob babbitt from caf and said look don't know if you know this is lauren parker this is what's just happened i really think she needs caf to reach out um mm. and bob's great bob babbitt's awesome and his team they got on it straight away they contacted lauren and so that was in may and so in in october lauren actually she discharged herself from hospital in order to come to the San Diego CAF big day, you know, challenge triathlon. And it was an amazing weekend for both of us, just seeing all these CAF athletes um, smile. Like they just don't, nothing gets in their way. The kids are running around, they're on their blades, they're on their wheelchairs, they're doing flips that, you know, they're smiling all over the place. There's so much laughter and energy. It was kind of a real eye opener that this is, that's just that's that they accept who they are and they just have so much fun with it and so yeah I, i've kind of been involved with cf since then um they've actually just launched this year um because of unfortunately because of covid um their big fundraising event this the san diego triathlon challenge in october uh, unfortunately can't take place but they just launched two days ago on the 8th of august a big community challenge where over the next next few months until the I think it's up to the 18th of October register online and then you log all your miles and it's about doing a million miles raising millions of pounds and helping empowering as many lives as we can through sports and so yeah I just there's something about sport and the opportunities is it's given me um that if I can help to give other people regardless of their physical mental capabilities and backgrounds that chance then um yeah i i love it like you just can't help smiling and feeling energized and grateful i guess when when you're with when you're with caf well maybe john can put, put that link on our uh, our facebook page i think that'd be really good for people yeah i'd love to and also as a as a little bit of a, a, a plug i'm also selling um i've got as a complete little bit of a hobby do some t-shirts sell some t-shirts and i've done one for caf which is a wheelchair racer and a um a athlete a sprinter with a prosthetic but the figures are made up of all the words that you might associate with actually with all sport but for caf athletes so like you know never give up determine drive and I'm selling those with all the profits are going to go back to CAF this year. So I'll, yeah, I'll send you the link because I'd love to get sure. some sales of those, get, get it up and running. No, that, that'd be great. And, and it, it is, you know, you've always had a good perspective of sport and, and it is nice when you can have, you know, something other than just um, yourselves uh, sort of focused on and, and, you know, it sport does transcend across a lot of different areas. So this, it's really neat. And the the thing I, li I like about sport is that it also levels the playing field. Mm -hmm. Like when you're standing on that start line of a race and you're, you know, everyone's literally stripped down, but in their wetsuits or their tri kit or they're on their bike, you have no idea who anyone else is apart from they are a fellow athlete standing next to you and you are all going to get through this together. doesn't matter backgrounds, history, whatever it is. At that point, you are all on that start line together well and, and with this COVID 19 and the lack of racing i think we've all taken a step back and really tried to you know evaluate or maybe reevaluate why we do the training or uh or the races and 
uh, and, and getting involved with another organization like CAF certainly it does help. Uh, but it, we are all reflecting on, on why we're doing this. And it's not just to do a sport. There, there's more to it. That's right. Right. And I think as well, for me, I've realized that, you know, yes, I, I am missing the races. And I think I realize I miss it more. I've had the opportunity to jump into a couple of the, the virtual races, which have been brilliant. They've given me that kind of buzz that we all look for and those adrenaline. But um, I, it also has made me realize that, yeah, I actually do this because I just love the sport and I love the training aspect. But what I, I love and what I'm missing, and this is the hard bit, is that connection with people. And, yep. you know, we do, I do the sport because I love it. I love the training, but I love the opportunities I get when I travel and I get to meet people or I can connect with my training group and the community action. And that's why I think, you know, you guys, I, I know have done a great job over the last few months at trying to keep that, that connection through zoom through you know through the virtual world as much as you can and i think that's 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 really powerful because i think that's where we kind of struggle yes triathlon is an individual an individual sport and at the end of the day it's us racing or it's us training but the thing we all love about it is that community and I think that's almost harder than the races that went, you know, they, we don't have a race, but actually what we love about the racing is the athletes and the community when we're there and that buzz that we get. And that's what, that's what I'm missing. I'm like just itching to get on a plane and go and give somebody a hug and, and, and meet up with friends that you kind of, you see at the races and then you haven't seen them for a while. And another friend that, you know, that pop up, that's, that's what is, yeah, that's also what kind of what's keeping me going as well. You know, I was thinking about the other day, I hadn't shaken somebody's hand in like six months. Like touched, yeah. other than my wife, I haven't touched anyone, right? It's a weird thing, right? Cause we're so tactile creatures. And like you said, like give somebody a, a hug, but it's not even, it, it, it's not even in the, on the cards right now. And I'm, I'm, I just realized how much I miss that. Yeah. And, you know, like these Zoom calls are great. And, and honestly, John and I, we've had such a good connection during this time and, and connecting with so many other people uh, this way, but you miss like that physical connection. And uh, yeah, I, I, it's, it's super tough for all of us. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, um, I, I had a, a meeting the other day and it was, you know, all that social distance, but automatically as you, when you're meeting someone for the first time, you, you and we, we all kind of went to do it and then we're like, oh, I can't yeah. do that. Yeah. And right, we've now got to, you know, and it's, elbow maybe. Yeah. yeah, and it's just so weird. And even, you know, yeah, I, I even think, you know, even maybe if you're not as much of a hugger, but just the fact that you, oh. I think if you, if you choose not to hug people, that is fine, but it's when it's taken away and you can't do it is when it's kind of like that struggle and that for so long and, um, yeah, it's been, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard, really hard. Yeah. Well, we, we said we'd keep you, uh, at an hour. We're at an hour and I think this is a great place to, uh, to, to, uh, bring it, bring, wrap everything up because I, I agree with you. I think, you know, I'm a very, you know, I train on my own. I don't mind going to a race on my own, but yet I miss that community and that ability yeah. to celebrate with each other and, share stories and, uh, and, and, it, and we, all, we all are missing that. But this has been great to talk with you and hear more of your story and, uh, and how you connect with uh, foundations like Challenge Athlete uh, Foundation. And, and so really thank you for, for taking time to talk with us. No, um, I've really enjoyed it. It's been my connection to, to the world for this evening and stuff. And thank you for having me on. And I, I really hope that, yeah, we can be doing this face to face with handshakes, with hugs, with high fives, with you both, but with everyone else very, very well, as soon as we can. Let's hope it gets back there. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you. Well, I'm going to say uh, thanks everyone who's watched this and uh, thanks, Ted. Thanks, Laura. This has uh, been a lot of fun. Thank thanks, you. guys. All right. I'm going to stop the live stream and I'll